All right, there as we read Ezekiel chapter 22, it's sad to say, but some of the things we just read sounds a lot like America. Yeah. Like a country that's gone in the wrong direction and is beginning to reap the fruit thereof because of the wrath of God. Uh -oh. Now look at verse 25 here where it says, There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls, they have taken the treasure and precious things, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. So here he's telling us, in this country, there is a conspiracy of the spiritual leaders to do the opposite of what God wants. Yeah. They are teaching lies. They are going against the Word of God. And it's, he compares them to wolves. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 22. He says they're like wolves ravening. Now, ravening means to like devour something, tear something apart. If you can imagine a wolf or a lion getting a hold of somebody or something and with their teeth, their claws, just tearing something apart. Right? That's how God is comparing these spiritual leaders and what they're doing spiritually speaking. Whenever the Bible uses the phrase wolf or wolves about people, it's talking about false prophets. God always compares false prophets to, when He says wolf, it's always a false prophet trying to kill or hurt innocent people. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Jesus is saying there's a false prophet, they look like a sheep, they look like a good person, they look like a man of God, but it turns out they are anti-God, anti-Christ. Yeah. And we're warned, the, you know, a, a wolf in the Bible is a false prophet, it is somebody that is a reprobate. Yeah. This is somebody that's rejected. We don't just casually use the phrase a wolf in sheep's clothing about somebody because according to the Bible, that means there's no hope for them. Yeah. That means they've crossed the line with God. And not, you know, these false prophets will appear as Christians. The title of my sermon tonight is The Wolf Pack. And we're talking about Darby, Schofield, and Larkin. These are fake Christians, yeah. fake men of God, that have propped up these political doctrines and teaching it as if it's spiritual. Yeah. Right. They're taking things and they're lying about the Bible. They're using mysticism and all manner of wickedness to try to take the Word of God and cause people to doubt the Word of God. Right. And what I want to help you do is doubt what men write and trust in the Word of God. Amen. All right. Now look, these men were actually working for the devil to help create a Zionist world order to try to establish an anti-Christ kingdom and throne and all of this is through mystery religion all of their information and their so-called wisdom is the wisdom of the world which comes from man from a dark heart and they do this from what's commonly known as dispensational theology yeah. dispensational theology and all three of the men that we're going to talk about tonight they contradicted biblical salvation and what's interesting, like any false prophet, the Bible says you'll know them by your fruits. Right. And the fruit it's talking about is your words, right? By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. Right. These false prophets, you can find a quote where it says, well, it's only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you find another quote from another book or another writing where that, well, you have to keep the law. You obviously have to obey. And you begin to see a contradiction just in salvation, which tells you that the foundation of these men is obviously off. That's right. Now, John Darby, Cyrus Schofield, and Clarence Larkin are the men we're talking about. And all three of these men are guilty of changing the Bible. That's right. Of trying to change the Word of God. You're there in Revelation 22. Look at verse number 18. He says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Amen. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written 
therein. So a wolf in the Bible is somebody that is unsavable. They're a false prophet. They're a hater of God. What the Bible would call a reprobate. God is literally saying, the place where their name could be written down, I've removed it. Their name cannot go in, the, in God's book of life because of, of what they've done to change the Word of God. To deceive people by changing God's words and say it's of God. And now reprobates are rejected of God. They're false prophets. Reprobate simply means rejected. And you have to understand, not all reprobates are sodomites, but every reprobate is a false prophet. Every reprobate is going to be a false teacher in some way or another. All right? They're going to want to push their doctrine or their selfish desire, they're going to they're gonna be a prophet for whatever they believe. And, you know, God foretold the future in Genesis 49 when He was talking about the 12 tribes. If you remember at the end there where He's giving prophecy about what will come in the latter days, it says, right? And of one of the things of the tribe of Benjamin, He said, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Now, how was it the tribe of Benjamin was a wolf, if a wolf is a false prophet, right? If a wolf is a reprobate. You remember the murderous reprobates in Judges 19? Yeah. Right? Now these guys, they were the disgusting sodomites. In Judges 20 he says, Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities of Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. So in the Bible, a wolf is, a, is someone that's rejected of God. They're a son of the devil, and they are attacking God's people. Yeah. So these three men, Darby, Schofield, and Larkin, they are trying to get money. They're trying to deceive people. They were doing things out of a wicked heart. Yeah. And God says that they're unsavable because they've changed the Word of God. Now, the first guy we're going to look at is John Nelson Darby. And he actually, well, there's a lot of things he did. Let me give you a brief summary. He was born in 1800, died in 1882. He was a lawyer, um, and then he became an Anglican Bible teacher. Now, Anglican simply means they came English. The word Anglo-Saxons became English. We speak the English language. It used to be the Anglos. But all that, being in England in religion means you came from the Church of England, which is a Protestant movement. It came out of Roman Catholicism. So he had all these Catholic doctrines, and it's evident in his writings if you look at what he teaches. He was the founder of what he called the Exclusive Brethren. He created his own little cult, basically. It was very exclusive. They had a lot of secrets. And even the Brethren in later days had great arguments with him about the things he began to teach. Yeah. Um, he's considered to be the father, the father of modern dispensationalism. Right Now, to dispense means to give out. In the Bible, if you look at where the word dispensation is used four times, now we're not going to go back to the Greek, but if you look at the concordance and say, what is this word and where else was it used, you'll find that the same word for dispensation was used three times for steward. Right, So if you've been dispensed something, the gospel has been given to us as an example. God has committed the gospel to me, now I dispense it. Now I am a steward, I'm responsible to give it back out. That's right. It's a very simple understanding, it's not, it's not complicated. But people will often say, well I'm a minor dispensation or a hyper dispensational. And all they're saying is, I believe, I look through these lenses that I just chop up the Bible into different eras. And I say, well all this is not for me, and you know, only this much is for me. And this is very common today where people say, oh, well, well, but I'm not a hyper-dispensational. Well, I hate to break it to you, but anything to do with dispensationalism goes back to changing the Word of God and changing salvation itself. Yeah. Turning it into works at one time or another, which the Bible says they should be accursed for doing such a thing. Right. So anybody that ascribes to this theology has a very bad foundation. They have problems. And listen, there are people that have bad doctrines that are saved. Being saved is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and that alone. Yeah, and we're yeah. preaching this because we are a non-dispensational church. We're non-Calvinist. We're not ruckmanite yeah. There's all these other isms that are popping up. And it's my responsibility to show you why we don't believe what we believe. Amen. Again, I want you to have confidence in the Word of God without the footnotes of Schofield. Yeah. Without the teachings of Darby. Right. Without the drawings of Clarence Larkin. Yeah. I want you to trust the Word of God in it alone. Amen. Now, 
Darby, because he came from a Catholic background, he began to teach this modern dispensationalism, and he came up with what's called the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. The Lord will return at any moment. Imminency is what it's often known as. It can happen at any moment. And we've all probably heard it in one place or another. Yeah. God can come back at any moment. Yeah. You know, we don't know what, you know, hey, you could die at any moment. That's very imminent. Right. You could die and <laughs> not even be ready for it. And that's very common. But the Lord has clearly taught us that there are certain things that must come to play before He returns in His second coming. And they try to confuse the, the issue and where it says coming, they say, well, that's not the coming. That's, a, that's the rapture. The rapture is not even in the Bible. Rapture is taken where it just means caught up. So they use very vague and mysterious things. And they'll, they're like, it's like a, they just pull it out of context and they'll, they'll use one thing over here to then define whatever they want to teach. And it's a very dangerous doctrine. And... It was, it was, he made it popular in the 1800s, 1830s. It really started to get popular. And there were a lot of uh, Protestants and even Catholics that were opposed to it because they believe in all millennialism. They would believe that there is no true reign of Christ, that it's just symbolic. It's symbolizing that the Catholic Church is here, therefore that's God reigning. And that's why they say the Pope is in charge. Now, there is a true return of Christ. There is a reign to happen. So he began to attach to a true doctrine of premillennialism, but then he added with that pre-tribulationalism. He's saying nothing bad's going to happen. We're just going to be, you know, vaporized and get out of here, but the Bible is very clear. In the last days before the return of Jesus Christ, true believers, Christians will go through persecution. That's right. We will go through suffering, and God wants us to be awake and aware and prepared so that we can preach the gospel. Amen. That's the purpose of it. And dispensationalism, as he taught it, teaches that all of time is divided in seven different ages. Okay? He teaches paradise, and then Noah, and Abraham, then Israel, the Gentiles, the Spirit, and the Millennium. And what he's trying to do is like, take a hatchet to the Bible. Well, this part was for them, and then that's for them, and then that's for somebody else. You know, and which would, which would say, don't even read the rest of that. Don't even bother looking at what it says. And that's why oftentimes when you speak to somebody that's dispensational, and you reference something from Matthew, Matthew 24, oh, no, 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 that's not for us. God said every word is for me. Yeah, right. How can you say it's not for us? And this is because they've been blinded by dispensationalism. Right, yeah. And John Nelson Darby wrote his own Bible. Yeah. You can download the PDF for free. And I have a copy of it. I've been comparing some things. And it's, it's you know, he came out of Catholicism, essentially. And so his Bible matches up perfectly with Catholicism. Yeah. I have a Dewey Reams Bible, an original pulpit Bible from a Catholic church. And it compared. I mean, it's the same things have been changed and altered. It's the same thing that you see in the Westcott and Hort versions in the later 1800s. There's obviously doctrines that are under attack. The deity of Christ hell and all those things and he did the same thing why because his heart his father is of the devil right it's the same spirit That's right. in his bible in luke chapter 4 he says in verse 8 where it says and jesus answering said unto him thou shalt do homage to the lord thy god whereas our bible says and jesus answered and said unto him get thee behind me satan for it is written thou shalt Worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. He takes out where Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan. He takes out worship and changes it to homage. So he literally cuts up things, removes things out of his Bible. There's whole lists of it. I could spend an hour or more just going through that. But I want you to know, and you can look it up for yourself, that the Darby Bible eliminates a lot of Scripture, yeah. right? And what's the Bible saying? If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Right. John Nelson Darby is in hell yeah. right now. Right. Now, one of the big distinctions about what he taught, what was new, was about the, the Jews versus the Christians. He was teaching that the Jews are different and better, that they have another way of salvation other than Jesus. He was a worker for Zionism, which is a political movement to basically ultimately to start a war in the Middle East to try to rebuild Jerusalem without them turning their hearts to Christ because they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 6, actually, let me, let me give you a quote from Darby. Israel is always the people of God 
and cannot cease to be the people of God. Now we have a problem here. Israel is a nation. And salvation is on an individual level. Yeah. All right? I am saved because of what I have believed. I am not saved because of what my dad did. I am not saved because I'm an American. I'm saved because of what I heard of God and I believed it. He didn't believe that. But again, he changes the gospel throughout the ages. It, the Bible is clear that he says, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, but they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Yeah. Israel heard the gospel and they rejected it. They didn't believe it. Right. They were broken off. Yeah. Right? It says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. So Darby obviously ignores a lot of areas in the Bible. Yeah. Another quote, The Jews are the habitual object of the thoughts of God. For, although He cannot recognize them for the moment as being under His chastening hand, they are nevertheless still His people. Wrong. wrong. That's dead wrong. He's saying, well, you know, they're still kind of... No. You either are saved or you're not saved. There's no in between. There's no gray in this area. John 1.12, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. I've believed. I'm adopted. I'm trusting in the Lord alone to get to heaven. In Hebrews 12, He says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is He whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Darby is a bastard. Darby is not a son of God. He did not put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. He changed the words of God and, and he, he had a perverted view of things. In 1 Peter 2, he says, But ye are a chosen generation. This is written to Christians. Right. This is written to Christians. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, yeah. which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Hey, we are now the people of God. Yeah. Not because of the good work that I have done, but because I've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. I've repented of my dead works, and now I have living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The next guy that we're going to talk about, if you would, turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter number 1. The next one we're going to talk about is Cyrus Schofield. C.I. Schofield. Yeah. Now, he was born in 1843, died in 1921. This guy was a criminal and a deceiver, and he popularized the writings of John Nelson Darby with the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, this publication was originally supposed to be published using the revised version, the 1884 Catholic Bible. But the Oxford publishers, which obviously had a Masonic and a, a Jewish influence because they were trying to create through the Balfour Declaration, they were trying to establish Israel as a nation again. They, they said, no, 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 let's, let's use the authorized version. Let's use the King James Version so we'll have more widespread acceptance. If they'll accept it for which Bible version it is, then maybe they'll look at your footnotes and begin to trust it. Because many of his footnotes were simply expounding on what Darby had started. The footnotes change the Bible meaning completely in a lot of different passages. All you have to do is turn to page 1 and you find heresy. Very wicked, messed up heresy. And most Baptists do not agree with all the footnotes of Schofield. Most Baptists will even say, I don't even I don't think Schofield was saved because he was wrong here or there. And it's like, well then why do you trust it? They they trust his writings and his view on the rapture and dispensationalism as if he is an authority. Yeah. Hey, what's our authority in this church? Bible. The Bible. It is not footnotes, it's not side notes, it's not what some somebody says on YouTube or on right. Facebook or on websites. It's what God says. These things are spiritually discerned. And His Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. But if you have an agenda, and if you want to try to accomplish something, you can find a verse in the Bible that you can add footnotes to, that you can take out of context, and you can accomplish your agenda yeah. and make it sound like it originated in the Word of God. But anytime you have somebody bring up a doctrine, they say, you know, that just doesn't sound right. Go to the Bible. Right. If somebody comes to you with Calvinism and say, well, God picks who goes to heaven and who goes... 
Well, show me a verse for that. Go to the Bible. If somebody says, hey, you have to turn from your sin to be saved, say, show me a verse. If they have one, go to the Bible. Because many of the verses they use do not teach that. If you right. simply read it in context, it's very easy to disprove what false teachers are teaching. They don't have the Spirit of God. And it just it blows my mind how many Baptists use the Schofield Bible as an authority. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. And again, this guy, this guy was a deceiver. He was a criminal, and I, I don't use that phrase lightly. In 1873, he was arrested in, in prison for signing a false oath of office by lying. In 1874, he was taking bribes and bribing people. Also in 1874, he was guilty. According to the Scriptures, we are to provide for our own. Else we're worse than an infidel. We're worse. Yeah. We're like a heretic. If yeah. you don't provide for your family, that is wicked. Amen. And this guy bailed on his wife and two children. And then he wrote letters saying, I have an investment. I need $1,300. And he got his wife that he had abandoned to ask her mom for the $1,300. And he then sent them a forged document. Oh, here's the investment. He took the money and ran. Abandon his children. I mean, this guy's a wicked person. Yeah, yeah. To do that to children, right. he didn't provide for his own. Then he got arrested again for fraud and forgery in 1877. Then in 1879, failure to pay a promissory note. Hey, when you swear something, whether to God or to man, you ought to do it. Right? Who sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. If you promise to do somebody, even if later you say, ah, I shouldn't have done that. Now it's going to hurt. Hey, you still need to do it. You need to be a man of your word, yeah. right? That's what the Bible teaches. Again, he divorced in 1883. Um, he uh, got in trouble for a false degree. 1902, a false story about war decoration. And then in 1909, he had a big conversion. And he adds to the word of God. All of a sudden, he's a man of God with great understanding. Yeah. And where, many people would question even where his scholarship comes from. And all of a sudden, he produces this new theological you know, documents, which really is rehashing what, what Darby taught. And what it was, he had somebody prop him up and put him in a position of profit where he can make money. So 1909, he introduces his first Bible. 1917, he comes back with a newer edition, adding more footnotes, taking these concepts in Genesis 12 about the promise to Abraham and making it clearly it's talking about that Israelites should be living in the land. You know, making these lies that a lot of people depend on now. Most Christians, if you ask them about Judaism or Israel, well, they're God's chosen people. Yeah. And where did this come from? Because this did not exist 100 years ago. Yeah. This was a new doctrine. Even with his 1909, it wasn't as widely accepted. The 1917, they began publishing and giving them away for free to Bible students and seminaries. And Moody Bible was a big one in Texas. And then even after his death in 1967, they published another revision. And if you've ever seen the third edition of the Schofield, they take the heresy that's in the footnotes, the words and the concepts that he wanted to preach out of the revised version, the Catholic Bible, and they literally put it right in line with the text. It's sold as a King James Bible, but they have brackets, and then they put the word that you would find in the Catholic Bible right there in line. And it's wicked. You know, again, many anti-Catholic people would, oh, well, Schofield, he's got it going on. Man, he's an idiot. He's a liar. He's a yeah. deceiver and a criminal. This quote I want to read, he says, explaining dispensationalism, and this is Yonah Malachi of the Institute of Contemporary Jewry. The Hebrew University of Jerusalem said, the basic element of modern dispensationalism and that which gave the movement its name is the belief that human history is divided into well-defined periods or dispensations in which God relates to man in different ways according to the classical definition of C.I. Schofield. One of the movement's leading theologians. A dispensation is a period of time during which man is tested in respect to obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Seven such are distinguished in Scripture. What they're essentially teaching here is works. Yeah. Adam had to do the works. Noah had to build the ark to get saved. And they, David had to do certain things to get saved. And they turned salvation into works in every period of time, except now we happen to be in the, the lucky one, right? Yeah. But yet, God is unchanging. He says, I change not. Yeah, right. The gospel has always been the same. Yeah. In Genesis chapter 4, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. What were they calling for? 
salvation right. of the soul, of the spirit, knowing that it was by believing on the Lord. Right. His seven dispensations that he teach, innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, church, and eternity. And the thing is, with Schofield, even though he was going off of what Darby wrote, his writings actually made it all the more confusing. He has a lot of contradictions when you dig deeper about where he says, well, this one is this era. Well, it's over here. He has a lot of passages that you cannot fit into his chart of well, this, you know, through Matthew to here is for them. And it, a lot of it just doesn't even fit in. And amongst dispensationalists themselves, they will argue about the first 11 books of Acts. Was well, that really for the Christians? Well, no, I think, well, that was for the first church, but that's not for us. That's still, well, that was for, it's like, man, all of it's for you. Yeah. Every word of the Bible is for us. Yeah. And these men are wicked. Yeah, they are. Look at this. There is a beautiful system in this gradualness of unfolding. The past is seen to fall in periods marked off by distinct limits and distinguishable period from period by something peculiar to each. Thus it comes to the understood that there is a doctrine of ages or dispensations in the Bible. And what he is simply saying not all the Bible is for you. There's an end to it. There's a distinction. You can't read it. You can't understand it. It doesn't apply to you. But hey, there are things in Genesis that can apply to us today. Yeah. In Deuteronomy, in Kings, yeah. all of the Bible. In Ezekiel, there are things that apply to today and that still match up with the, with the New Testament exactly. Yeah. Now, in, you guys are in Galatians 1. In uh, 2 Corinthians 11, it says, For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel that ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Bear with him means contend. Like if somebody comes to you and they say, well, you know, it's not the Jesus of the Bible you're talking about. Well, it's a different gospel. Over here they're saved by works. Over here they're saved by grace. All right, like these Ruckmanites. Those yeah. people are un- saved right. and we should be able to contend with them out of the scriptures you're in galatians chapter one look at verse eight but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have preached unto you let him be accursed yeah. as we said before so say now i again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be accursed the Jewish religion does not have another way to get to heaven. It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. Right. And to use the Bible to try to prop up and create a nation state in Palestine and try to say that it's the people of God, it's the people that were once called Jews or Israel, is a total lie. I mean, most people's bloodline has been completely eliminated. Yep. And if you speak about these things, most people will call you an anti-Semite, yeah. right? However, the Semitic people in the Bible included certain areas close to Iran and Turkey. It wasn't just exclusive to the 12 tribes. And when you dig in deeper, you know, the, yes, the 12 tribes were of the Semitic peoples. And for me to say Judaism is a lie, I'm not attacking a race. I'm saying that it's a religion that is deceptive. The religion of the Jews is based out of Egypt. And it comes through Mystery Babylon. What you see in the Talmud, what the Jews' religion is, is written today, is the, Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. Yeah. Yeah. So the things that Judaism would teach is not the Bible. They do not believe in the God of the Bible, and without that, they are lost. They're on their way to hell. That's right. Now, Clarence Larkin, this guy was born in 1850. He died in 1924. He was an Episcopal architect. He was an Episcopalian. A lot of people joke and call them the Whiskey Palians because they drink. They openly, someone will drink in service, not necessarily like it's a, a, a like get togethers at the church. Uh, the Episcopals today are known for having all the sodomites, the dyke preachers, and lesbians, and all that stuff. But he came out of that movement. He converted to being a Baptist. But with him, he brought a lot of the Protestant doctrines, a lot of those, the, the theology. And again, we're Baptist, we're not Protestant. We don't protest the Catholic Church. We didn't come out of the Catholic Church. Right. We are Christians. We were around long before the Catholics. The church did not begin with the Catholics. And he commonly, Clarence Larkin, this guy used the revised version in many of his books. And there is actually a movement among independent fundamental Baptists where they're taking Larkin's writings 
And they're trying to correct it and go back to the King James. And again, it's like, dude, if, if it's got a bad foundation yeah. and the guy changes the Bible and he believes differently on certain, it's like, why would you even trust anything he said? Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't believe the Word of God. No, he doesn't. He's most known for his book that's called Dispensational Truth. The very humble title called The Greatest Book on Dispensational Truth in the World. What a humble guy, you know? <laughs> I wrote the best. Like, dude, come on. Pipe down a little bit. <laughs> What's interesting about, about Clarence Larkin is, you know, he was an architect. And the Freemasons will use that phrase about God. And Clarence Larkin used a lot of terminology that actually aligns with the occult. He used a lot of symbolism and drawings that, that fall right in hand with what the Rosicrucians taught. Now, the Rosicrucians are a secret society inside of the Catholic Church. Rosicrucian simply means rosy cross. That was their symbol. And a lot of the occult teachings and drawings that he did, you can actually line it up hand-to-hand hand hand with Hermes and the Kabbalah and certain, certain mystical things. And I'm not going to get deep into that. But I do want you to understand that he came out of the Roman Catholic Church, which had already polluted doctrine. Right? It came, they came out of paganism. And then inside, there's a controlling factor that worships the devil. You've heard it said that all roads lead to Rome. I would say that all false religions would pass through Babylon and you know, worship the gods of Egypt. You know? And you can see some of that in the writings. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, yeah. speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And if you remember, we're talking about wolves here that are reprobates that are given up, they're given over, they have their conscience seared. They can do things like this and deceive people about the Word of God because they hate God. Yeah. Because they don't want you to know the truth. And if you would turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. So Clarence Larkin, through he was widely known for, let me see if I can find one of them here, for his pictures, his drawings of history and timeline. Uh, he took the concepts of dispensationalism and of end times, and he tries to bring it all together to bring it into unity to where they can teach the things that Judaism would still teach today, the same doctrines and try to merge it with Christianity so that he can teach the things that are contrary to the Word of God. And here's, here's kind of a, a funny quote. The more, the more that I read this guy, I just kind of sit back and say, I mean, how can people be so deceived? Yeah. But what it comes down to is people that don't want to do the work for themselves. Yeah. If you don't want to do the work for yourself and you're not willing to read the Bible for yourself and cross-reference it yourself, you know, if you find a word, you're just reading your proverb of the day, and you see a word, and you say, well, that's, never heard that word, what's it mean? Well, you can do one or two, th well, three things, right? You can ignore it and move on. You can Google it, let somebody else do the work and tell you what it means. Or maybe you can do a word search and look where everywhere that word is at and see what it's used with and used in context and then find out what it actually means. And if you'll learn to use the Bible as a dictionary, you will not be led astray by these heresies and these false prophets. Now this guy, you know, Schofield taught in Genesis 1 what's commonly called the gap theory. Are you guys familiar with it? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Okay. Now, do you know what it actually means? The gap theory, I want to give you a couple quotes from Larkin where he's taken what they have and expound upon it. He teaches, here's, here's, here's the funny quote, it is well known fact that a vegetable diet renders the body more susceptible to spiritual forces than a meat diet. Uh, what? That's a well-known fact? Okay, so does this guy, is his perspective in true facts or is it in what he determines to be a fact? Now look, on speaking in, his, in spiritism and demonology, he says, the demons belong to the powers of darkness. So what he's trying to do here is separate fallen angels 
from demons. Okay? He says, Veterans of the service of Satan, their central camp or abode is the bottomless pit from which they sally forth at the command of their leader. He's saying the devil can bring demons out of hell whenever the devil wants to. There are passages that talk about devils that are fallen angels that are that are bound in hell now. Now they can't get out once they're in there. Nobody can get out of hell once they're in there. The devil is not down in there. And the reference he's talking about there in Revelation chapter 9, I want you to look at this. It's not talking about the devil leading demons. Verse 1 he says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded to them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only, look at this, only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's literally talking about, okay, so here it says there are locusts that come out of the pit. God uses them when pouring out His wrath to hurt only the men that are not of God. The people that have taken the mark of the beast will be tormented by God on the earth. And this is God pouring out His wrath, but He's going to turn it and say that, it's, that they're demons. He says, listen, this is Clarence Larkin speaking. He says, they are not angels. Angels have bodies. He says, these are disembodied spirits. Clarence Larkin is teaching that a demon is a disembodied spirit. He's saying it was somebody that was once alive that is now in hell that can come back up as a spirit and possess other people. He says, they are supposed to be by many the spirits of the inhabitants of the pre-Adamite earth. <laughs> who si wait, wait, wait. wait. Pre-Adamite earth. Gap. Genesis 1, yeah, gap theory. This is what they're talking about. Oh, there's a comma there. I'll bet you in between that comma, there was a judgment. There was a whole other world that existed. And all those people that God destroyed before Adam, they're now in hell. And they come and go as they please because they're demons. This is what he taught. This is the doctrine of devils. Amen. This is very strange. This is to cause you, well, wait a minute. If right here in Genesis, in, in just that little space, there's all this untold history... I'll bet there's all sorts of other stuff that we don't know. And what he's doing is causing you to doubt the Bible by yeah. teaching this heresy. He says, The conduct of demonized men or women seems to be indicate that the demon takes possession of them for the purpose of physical, physical sensual gratification, thus letting us into the secret of the cause of the wreck of the pre-Adamite earth, the sin of sensuality. What he's saying is, when a devil possesses somebody, he's just doing what God destroyed the earth for before. In the midst of God creating the earth, he's putting a lie that God has already destroyed the earth. He just changes the whole foundation. If you change the first chapter, hey, from there, all bets are off. Your assumptions are completely off. Yeah. If you use this man's drawings or, or Schofield's notes as a crutch for your learning and understanding of the Word of God, then you will begin to doubt the things of God. You don't learn to pray and seek God for understanding of the Bible. You don't learn to use the Bible as a dictionary. Your first instinct, and this is pre-Google, well, let me go see what, what Dr. Larkin says about it. Let me go see what this great man says about it. And this is wicked. This is not how we should treat the Bible. And he's, he's basically saying that there were people before that died that are in hell that can come and go as they please. Well, how did they get saved? Again, dispensations. They were saved different than we were. One th another thing that he teaches is the four Gospels. And if you've ever really talked to a Ruckmanite, Peter Ruckman took a lot of the information from Clarence Larkin and then he just really embellished it and exaggerated it and found m multiple ways to sell it. And what he teaches is that even from the New Testament, there's four Gospels being taught. He says that there was the, the Gospel that John the Baptist and Jesus preached. 
Then he says, it is the gospel of... Listen, this, this is so foolish. It is the gospel of salvation, but the gospel of the kingdom is not for salvation, but for a witness that it is the announcement of the time was come to set up the kingdom. Wait a minute. So this guy is an Anglican, or, or uh, not Anglican, well, Episcopal, right? Which they're all millennial. They don't believe in a millennium. That's where his roots are. And he's saying, they're setting up a kingdom. This gospel of the salvation, the gospel of the kingdom is not for salvation. No, no, no. When it says salvation, you don't understand. You got to go back to the Greek. You got to go back to the Darby Bible. Right? What a lie. Yeah. I mean, what a strange thing to teach, just confusing people. And it's hard for me to even read it. And there's so much more we could go into here. But I want you to know, if somebody comes to you with dispensation as a doctrine that they have as a foundation, you need to understand that this person is not well studied in the scriptures. They might be well studied in these three men. And they might be able to parrot what these three men have taught them. But they're not able to think for themselves and to reason from the scriptures by themselves. They, they are using these things as a crutch. The next gospel is the gospel of the grace of God that Jesus died on the cross for our salvation. Well, that one sounds right. Yeah. But why are there four? And there's contradictions. He says, It is to this gospel that Satan, the God of this age, is particularly anxious to blind the minds of those who believe not in the premillennial coming of the Lord. So again, he ties it to, to the end times, to the eschatology, the next gospel. I'm sorry, that, is, that one is the gospel, the glorious gospel. Kingdom, the glorious is separate. Salvation, you know, grace of God is separate. And then there's the everlasting gospel. Well, that's separate too. Listen, the Bible teaches salvation has always been the same. Yeah, yeah. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, if you believe that God would be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and you call upon him for salvation, he will hear your call. Amen. He will answer you you will be saved. Amen. If you trust in these things, you will not. And there are many people that are deceived by what these guys write. He also goes into the symbolism of the pyramid, which I'm not really, I'm not going to get off into that. So I'm gonna, hold on, let me show you this real quick. I'll just show it to you. Which the pyramid, as many of you, of you probably know, is, has a New Age meaning. Yeah. Like I said, a lot of what Clarence Larkin teaches, you can directly link to the Kabbalah, yeah. or you can link to the, the, Kabbal the Kabbalism and the, the New Age religions. And he teaches, which some of his information has since been proved scientifically inaccurate, but he shows how if you you know do a line in a circle and you show how it's on the perfect here and a perfect there, wrong lie. All the all this information is wrong. It's been proven wrong now that we have more information. But he uses these series of things to try to teach a salvation through the pyramid. That a, there's a picture of dispensationalism in the pyramid itself. Look, this guy's a joke, yeah. right? He's not saved. He changes the Bible. He's a deceiver. And one thing, I, the last thing I want to touch on with him is his view of the Trinity. Now, as with any deceiver, if you say enough words, there's probably something you're going to say that's right. I could show you quotes from Clarence Larkin that you would agree with about the Trinity. The problem is his doctrine is not godly. He says, a simple illustration may help us. The sun of our solar system is a Trinity. It manifests it in a threefold manner. Heat, light, and chemical action. This is a New Age teaching. This is an esoteric, occult teaching. Manly P. Hall essentially says the same things in his teaching of the Trinity. He says, So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not each in Himself God, but they in their united capacity are God. So notice he's saying Jesus is not God. Yeah. The Father is not God. He says, each person in the Godhead is more manifested in one age or dispensation than the other. The Father was manifested in the Old Testament times. The Son was manifested during His earthly times and during, during His earthly ministry. And the Holy Spirit is active in this dispensation. Well, what about the next dispensation? Who's going to be God? Right. I mean, it's, He's clearly saying they're not God. But He, he makes it very deceptive in how he writes it. And I, like I said, these are some of the very similar to what Manly P. Hall 
who wrote Morals and Dogma, some of the Freemasonry literature, the secret teachings for all ages, similar things about the Trinity that he's saying. Now you're there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be done with this. I just want to help you guys understand that these guys are copycats and they're teaching doctrines of devils. Yeah. Yeah, they, are. they are not here to edify you. You do not need to verify that what you teach is on par with them. I mean, this book, in my opinion, is worthless to me other than to expose it and say, stay away from this, John. Right, yeah. This yeah. is not of God. We don't need this. Right, Look, right. now we beseech you, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse, verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. Don't be troubled. Don't be deceived. Look at this next verse. Look, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The Bible is clear. When the Lord will return, and what has to happen first? There will be an Antichrist, and for the Antichrist to set up his kingdom, he needs a bunch of fake Christians to think that he's God. Yeah. And to worship him, and worship his image, and they'll take the mark of the beast. And we that are awake, that are enlightened by the Holy Scriptures, we're going to say, whoa, they're, they're calling this man God. That is the Antichrist. That guy has a devil. And the Bible tells us not to be deceived by any man. If you're foundation is built on church fathers rather than the Bible itself you're going to have bad doctrine oh, yeah. and with that let's remember that all three of these men are wolves in sheep's clothing there are many Christians that have been deceived they think well that guy was obviously a Christian look he wrote great things about the Bible and about Jesus and God. no he was a liar and they're trying to get money out of people yeah they are so check your source and if and learn to use the Bible as a dictionary let's pray Amen. father God thank you for your word Lord, thank you for the truth that we can find in your word clearly and plainly. Lord, we know that there are many things that are going to happen, including a great deception and an antichrist. And Lord, I pray that you would prepare us now to be used of you now, to be soul winners, and to go out and reach the lost. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the free gift of salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.